Okay, so um, I was asked to give a bit of a, um, a title that would generate discussion. Uh, so I, I, I thought this 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 phrase that it, it's the economy stupid, how, how everything kind of comes down to to economic questions. But is it is it really that, or is it the other way around? Is it actually the stupid economy that's that's maybe creating some issues? Uh, and is it is it the matter that in order to promote both sustainability and, and, and the economy, maybe we need to rethink what, what we mean by the economy. So this is going to kind of be the broad, the broad theme of today. So um, yeah, let's, let's get started. So uh, this is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, in general, we're going to be talking about energy as a, as a golden thread that connects many things. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about different energy trends, how it's had an exponential growth that it's been linked to several things, to climate change, to economic growth, to well-being. And we're also going to look at uh, kind of inequalities within energy. Who is energy for and, and for what? And then, and then the key question here is, can we cut this golden thread? In particular, can we cut the link between energy and climate change? Or, you know, you know, depending on the answer to that, do we also need to think of ways of cutting that thread, that link between energy and economic activity or, or energy and well-being? So, yeah, this is uh, this this somewhat kind of cheesy analogy, actually, I, I borrowed uh, from Ban Ki-moon, the former UN Secretary General. So he said that energy is the golden thread that connects economic growth, social equity and environmental sustainability. Um, so yeah, this today it's going to be a lot about energy. That's the topic that I focus on. But it's not kind of energy in a vacuum. It's 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 energy more as a, it's how how it connects, how it weaves through climate change, human well-being, and, and economic activity. So what what is energy? What do we mean by energy? Uh, so we we could say that everything is energy um, because it's because it's everywhere and it's actually you know. It, Everything requires energy in order to be sustained and to change, including human beings and, and human societies. Then I consider energy as, a, as an interesting lens to, to look at historical, social, and economic developments. Of course, energy doesn't explain everything, uh, but I think it is, is, is still useful, and in, in particular because it provides a clear link with climate change. Um, but, but more on that later. Um, so, how's it, you know? Energy kind of really long historical perspective on energy. Energy use has increased exponentially in the last couple hundred years, but uh, this is only a very recent phenomenon. It's, it's really only a blip in, in, in human history. Um, we as societies have become very dependent on, on external sources of energy. And we can see this when, for example, there is a power cut, you know, the, you know, what, what, what happens when the power goes? Um, you know, you, you can't turn on the lights, you can't charge your devices, the fridge, might, stuff in the fridge might go off, you can't cook properly perhaps, people get stuck in elevators, I don't know, no traffic lights, the traffic becomes a nightmare, businesses and then uh, other things can't work, can't produce. Um, so anyway, we've we become really dependent, but, uh, but as you can see in a long-term historical perspective, this is, this is only really a blip. And, and this, this blip has been very, very closely related to, to climate change and to emissions. So on the left here, you can see the increase in, um, let me see if I can, yeah. Oh. So can you see, I guess you can see that red dot now. Um, so you can see here how after the steam engine was invented and, uh, you know, um, improved by James Watt, how UK coal and world coal, coal production increased exponentially. And you can see the CO2 emissions associated with that. Now this, this gray square is the same gray square as here. You can see how that trend continued exponentially after that, and how coal and, and then oil started to impact um, the CO2 emissions quite significantly. And still today, uh, this is this is a figure for uh, 2016. We can see that greenhouse gas emissions divided by sector. We can see that energy, uh, the energy system, is responsible basically for around 
um, almost almost three quarters of, of that. And um, it has been it has been consistently that way. Uh, if you look at historical trends, energy systems have been um, consistently responsible for about um, yeah three, uh, three quarters of, of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and this has resulted in extremely worrying trends, um, and as I'm sure you're aware, um, this, has, this has resulted in cumulative levels of CO2 in the atmosphere that have led to increases in, um, in the global temperature. Um, so what some people have described as that we're doing is basically turning back the geological clock to, to a point where you know, we, we, agriculture and civilization happened at a temperature range that was fairly stable. We are at the point here that perhaps by, you know, um, by 2030 or our current trajectory, we'll be turning back the geological clock by about 3 million years, or maybe 50 million years by 2100 on, on our current trajectory again. And these is, it's, it's not to say that these um, changes in temperature haven't happened, it's just that there hasn't been a uh, human uh, species on Earth, or, and certainly not agriculture and civilizations as we know them, with such vast changes in, 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 in the temperature, such fast changes in temperature as well. Um, and, the, and you will have seen, perhaps, in the most recent uh, IP, IPCC report um, from working, to, working Group 2, this is the last paragraph in the, in the summary for policymakers. Um, so they say that the cumulative scientific evidence is unequivocal, climate change is a threat to human well-being and planetary health, any further delay in concerted anticipatory global action on adaptation and mitigation will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. Very high confidence in this. So basically, this, this link between energy and climate change has, has, uh, has not been without consequences, right? Our, our increased dependency and use of energy has, has had very real and uh, worrying, worrying, worrying consequences uh, in relation to climate change. Um, but okay, what, what else is uh, energy related to? So exploring exploring the, the golden thread here, the link with economic activity. So um, this this rapid increase in energy has also been inextricably linked to certain technological developments, um, as we can see here. Different different technological developments have um, accelerated our, our our use of of energy. Uh, but it's not. It's not only. It's not only technological developments. Um, other things that are related to increases in energy use are are, are population growth, for example. Um, that is true, but we also need to be kind of careful with that framing. Uh, consider, you know, different levels of, of energy use by different um, groups of people and kind of inequalities in in access and use and consumption. Um, also, the the for example, the rise of, of consumerism. Um, also, the role of increased um, capital and wealth accumulation, all, all of these factors are important in explaining this, this trend. And we can see that the, um, this increased use in energy has been very tightly coupled with real GDP uh, here. Uh, so, so again, and, and it's not surprising this really, we need energy to, to produce things to make the economy move, right? We need energy for, for all of these processes. So this tight coupling between energy and economic growth is really not, not very surprising. And then when it comes um, to the link between energy and well-being, uh, we know that energy is really important to improve standards of living. Um, so for example, um, particularly around issues of gender um, and gender inequality, if, if households are still cooking with uh, dangerous and inefficient cooking systems. This has a particularly disproportionate impact on, on women who usually tend to be doing the cooking and who usually are responsible for collecting firewood, for example. Uh, so we know that transition to more modern fuels has, has, a, has a tangible and significant impact on, on, on well-being. But also in countries like Canada, there's issues of um, energy poverty. So for example, here on the left-hand side, this graph shows that um, there's about uh, 2.8 2 million people in Canada 
uh, over 20% of the population um, are experiencing high home energy cost burdens. And this can be characterized as a, as a situation of energy poverty, as a, as a disproportionate um, expenditure on, on, on energy. And this, in terms of proportion of the population, this is particularly uh, worrying in Atlantic Canada. Um, but for example, the situation here in Ontario, um, it's still higher than the national average, and it's still a, a very significant number of households. Um, so, Anyway, this is this is kind of some, some of the links between energy and, and, and well-being. Um, but then, you know, what is this energy for? What are we using it for? And and um, you know, who who is having access to this energy? So for the case of electricity here, I wanted to share this um, this graph where we have seen that uh, at an OECD level. Um, well, first of all, the world average, this is at the bottom, there's the mean uh, residential electricity consumption per electrified inhabitant. So basically this is average electricity use. And then this is the share of the electrified population. So we can see that more people in the world have become electrified um, between 1980 uh, and 2004. And on average, they're using uh, more energy. In the OECD, you have you had already a 100% level of electrification. The trend has been just to use more energy. Um, and then this kind of upwards and to the right trend has been similar for Sub-Saharan Africa, um, for uh, la sorry, Latin America, for the former USSR and Eastern Europe, for Sub-Saharan Africa, for East Asia and China, for the OECD, for South East Asia and, uh, and for, for North Africa. It's the, the average has gone down a little bit, but the percentage of electrification has increased as well. So, so progress, progress has been made, but there's still a lot of people who don't have uh, access to electricity and that are still cooking with dirty fuels. So, and like I said, that has a um, has a significant effect on well-being. And then these averages, these, these, these kind of broad averages by regions or by countries only tell a partial story. So this, this black line here, uh, this horizontal black line represents uh, the 2000 Watt Society. So this was a calculation that some academics did uh, of what would be the energy required um, for any developed society to reach a sustainable level without reducing their standard of living. So if so, and then and then what, what the graph represents is the the blue or the red dots are the average that what we were talking about these these averages by country and the whiskers are just the the, the, the spread kind of the range of of, of of consumption here. This is uh, this is electricity. So, for example, in the case of Canada here, the average consumption is um, roughly 12 kilowatts per capita. This is 2012. But there are people that are consuming below five, and then there are people that are consuming, you know, all, you know, 24, something like that, kilowatts per capita. So what's, what's shocking here is that some countries have really high levels of inequality. So the US, the, the size of the whiskers is huge, and some other countries have very, very large whiskers. Uh, but also, uh, some countries, not even the lowest energy users, uh, achieve the, the sustainable level. Uh, and then there's the, the other case where not even the highest users for some countries achieve the sustainable level. So that means that. Um, they're not even um, they're not even uh, reaching a, a, a level that would allow for for a, for a high standard of living or for high levels of well being. Um, so yes, this is um, this is kind of a, a worrying trend that, that 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 well a worrying worrying situation that shows the, the huge levels of inequalities that, that we think, that we see. So how can we do about that? What can we do about it? Right. This is this is all painting a bit of a bleak story and I'm afraid to say it will it will continue a bit bleak but um, it'll it'll perk up towards the end I, I hope so yeah how can we how can we cut this golden thread and in particular 
around C here, around climate change. There's kind of three options that we can cut this thread. We can cut the link to economic activity, we can cut the link to human well-being, or we can cut the link to climate change. And usually, when you think about this, the, 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 the options that come out are, are fairly, fairly standard like surely we can solve this whole issue if we if we just move to renewables right or if we or if we make efficiency improvements or all these sorts of things uh so yeah so, so cutting another 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 way of, of, of saying uh cutting the golden thread is saying decoupling and um decoupling is 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 basically um it's about making things that move in the same direction, there are tightly coupled, for example, GDP and environmental pressures, let's say here CO2 emissions or uh, energy use, to make them move in slightly different directions, which means re relative decoupling. So GDP is not growing at the same pace as, a, or the environmental pressures are go growing at a slower pace than GDP. GDP is gross domestic product, right? A measure of economic activity. Uh, or even better, can we have an increasing level of economic activity with at the same time the, the the you know this thing moving in a completely different direction altogether or reducing right um so yeah the, the usual suspects if you're thinking about co2 emissions is um particularly from the energy sector is decarbonization let's move to renewables efficiency improvements let's let's do ways of, let's do things in a more efficient way or structural change right can we move to an economy that doesn't use as much energy um so yeah how much do we rely on these kind of usual suspects that, that i call and we rely on them quite a bit if you look at the at the scenarios this one in particular is from the international energy agency but if you look at scenarios in general for, for climate change and for, for energy use Efficiency, decarbonization are, are right up there as main, as main um, pathways towards kind of curbing emissions. Um, but then there's also some other, some other elements like um, more kind of unproven technologies and scale, at scale, like carbon capture, uh, utilization and storage, right? These sorts of things. Um, so yeah, this is this is the we, we rely. So you you know you you wouldn't be alone in in, in thinking about these usual suspects. You know most uh, international agencies when they're doing modeling, they they focus on these on these uh, aspects, and there's a reason for that. So another way of, of thinking about the decoupling issue involves a little bit of uh, a little bit of maths. So. Uh, bear, bear with me with this, it's, 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 not, it's not very complicated. So this is what's called the Kaya identity. So it's an identity because if you can cancel population with population, you can cancel GDP with GDP, you can cancel energy with energy, and basically you've got CO2 equals CO2. So it's, an, it's a complete identity, it's just sort of divided in, in different elements. Um, so population is fairly self-explanatory. GDP divided by population is basically GDP per capita. It's a measure of affluence, how, how rich a society is. Energy divided by GDP is what uh, we call the energy intensity of the economy. So that means how much energy do we use per every dollar of, of GDP produced. And then this is the carbon intensity of the energy system. So how much CO2 is emitted per unit of energy produced. And this sort of identity is very, very widely used in climate change modeling, um, including in the IPCC, uh, in order to calculate how much CO2 will be emitted. Uh, so then, therefore, then this, this, these amounts of CO2 emitted then are used as an input for modeling the carbon cycle, for modeling future CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, and then ultimately modeling levels of, of warming, right? So the traditional story uh, around decoupling assumes that um, you know population is unquestionable. We we um, you know there's there's demographic projections and those are are taken for granted and we move from there. Um, and like I said, we need to be careful about these um, formulations around around population. But also this element um, is taken is is taken for granted there modeling of how much um, 
you know, projections of future economic growth are taken for granted. And it's, it's assumed that this shouldn't be questioned. Like, of course, we want to be richer. So, so let's keep that in mind as we, as we go through. Um, so that means that in order to decouple GDP growth, which is basically this one here, this is what we're interested in, uh, from emissions, we need three things. And you will recognize these things because we talked about them earlier. They're basically the three usual suspects, right? We need efficiency improvements uh, at different levels of, of the energy chain, at the final energy stage and at the primary energy stage. Uh, we need decarbonization, so moving to renewables to, to reduce the energy, the CO2 intensity of energy. And we need perhaps structural change of the economy. Can we move to a service economy where, where basically our economy is not so reliant on, on energy to, to produce goods and services? So let's discuss each one of these at a the time. Uh, efficiency improvements. Um, what, what do we mean by that? And what do we mean about efficiency improvements at, at, um, at the different stages? So this is a, this is a representation of, of what, what, uh, what's called the energy chain, where you go from primary energy to final energy to useful energy and towards energy services. So primary energy is kind of the harnessed energy reservoirs, for example, uh, extraction of oil from an oil well or captured en energy flows, for example, sunlight. Um, then you have some fuel transformations or electricity generations, and that, that leads you to the final energy, which is refined fuels and electricity. So for example, from the energy you captured from the sun, you can generate electricity, or you can refine oil and make gas or, or petrol for cars, right? Then you got final energy, which is energy after it's been processed, then you have useful energy, which is basically uh, not the actual uh, liters or gallons of, of, of gasoline or, or gas, or it's not the kilowatt hours of energy, but it's actually what we can do with that. So it's, um, you know, high temperature heat or, or it's uh, mechanical work or it's illumination, those sorts of things. And then you have energy services, which are the actual things that we need. That's what we actually need for our well-being, which is thermal comfort in our homes or mobility, getting from A to B, or information and communication. That's, that's what we actually need. Uh, so one thing to note from this graph is the huge amount of losses. Most of the, most of the energy is, is lost uh, during all the conversion stages. So actually, our energy system is very very inefficient. So go, going back to this question about this usual suspect of efficiency improvement, there's, there's kind of potentials and limits to this efficiency. Potential is, you know, there's a lot of potential to reduce these losses. Uh, so this is also represented here. This is the current energy use. We've got some economic potential, technical potential, and theoretical potential to, you know, potential gains from energy efficiency. So there's a lot of potential there, but there's two, two main limitations to the efficiency question. One of them is that we see that historically, um, efficiency doesn't increase too rapidly. And in some countries is plateauing. We see kind of this, this plateauing here in the case of the UK, in the case of the US has been, hasn't been increasing that much. So, okay, there is a lot of potential, but this is not happening nearly as, as fast enough. And then the other limitation is something called the rebound effect. So the rebound effect was uh, originally described by uh, William Stanley Jevons in the cold question, right? He thought that the more um, efficient uh, we become in, in terms of extracting coal, this was in, in England in the uh, 1800s, um, then we would require, we would end up using uh, less energy uh, to, to, to extract that coal and, and, and all of that. But, but what actually happened is, is what he predicted. We became more and more efficient in terms of extracting coal. And what that meant was that extracting coal became very cheap and that led to an even bigger use of coal. So yeah, this is, this is, this is what's called the rebound effect. In microeconomic terms, uh, there's kind of direct and indirect rebound effect. So direct rebound effect is, uh, for example, when we have cheaper electricity, 
so we leave the air conditioning all day. So we have cheaper electricity because of efficiency improvements, right? So we're using less. So a, a, a good example here as well is uh, the change to uh, efficient light bulbs. We're using less energy to illuminate our homes, but that might bring down our energy bills and therefore we might be inclined to leave the lights on all day. Or cheap gas, uh, so I'll leave the heating on all day or leave the engine on while parked. Those sorts of things are, are kind of rebound effects where you think that an improvement in the efficiency will lead to less energy use, but in reality, it leads to more. Indirect is, is, is a similar way. Uh, it's just indirect because perhaps we save, uh, we save um, some money in because of the more efficient use of the light bulbs that I mentioned earlier, but then that leads to a save in money that then I go and buy a huge TV or an SUV or something that ends up using even more electricity than I was using before. So it's like, um, yeah, it's like a backfire effect. And in macroeconomic terms, it has been calculated anywhere from one to over 100%. It's, it's quite difficult to calculate. But, um, but yeah, what, what this rebound implies is that while there may be efficiency improvements and savings in one industry that might move the economic activity to other sectors that are more energy intensive. Um, so, and, and also some ecological economists have argued that it is in fact this process of rebound or this process of uh, improvements in efficiency that, that, that is what drives economic growth, right? These savings in, in costs of energy actually end up driving economic growth in, in, in general. So anyway, those are the limitations of uh, efficiency improvements. On the one hand, uh, they've been stalling. Uh, and on the other hand, there's the rebound effect, which is very, very rarely, if at all, considered in, in modeling efforts. Um, the next element that, that I wanted to discuss with you is the decarbonization element, right? Um, can we generate and use energy with, with no emissions or very very little emissions. Like, of course, we should strive for this, uh, but the road is a bit more difficult than, than we might think. So, the IEA has, the International Energy Agency has historically revised down its outlook for global coal demand. So, the IEA keeps thinking that coal demand is going to be high, but it's actually been lower year on year than they suspected. Um, and on the other hand, it's, uh, it's year on year had to revise up its projections of, of um, global solar capacity. So we're kind of under, underestimating that the, the transition to renewables is happening much faster than we, than we think it would. Uh, but do these alternative energy sources, are they displacing fossil fuels? So what Richard Europe found in this in this article is that they really, they're, they're actually not displacing them. And that is because uh, increased levels of energy demand. So this, these new levels um, and higher levels of, of, of renewables are not displacing fossil fuels because they're basically just covering for increases in, in, in demand. So the IEA and others are, are now starting to look at energy demand, which is, which is quite a promising, um, promising uh, outlook. So, um, in the sustainable development scenario net zero policies, they're actually looking at reductions in demand, which is um, below, the, below the, the, the line here. So this is, this is actually quite promising. Um, and then finally, we have uh, the structural change element. Uh, can, we, can we change the economy to services? And the energy implications of the service sector usually are assumed to be quite small, but actually, uh, all these uh, networks, production of ICT, consumer devices, data centers, they're actually really energy intensive. So even a service economy has a physical reality somewhere. There's a data center somewhere that needs to be cooled 24 seven. So yeah, this is, um, so, so this is basically to say at this point that all of the three usual suspects have have certain limitations, um, and therefore the, the, the route to decoupling is not as straightforward 
decoupling kind of energy from from greenhouse and and greenhouse gas emissions from from climate change is not as straightforward as we might have thought. I'm going to skip this slide just to just to just to um, talk about this um, this element. Uh, this is this is this is a paper uh, where the authors systematically identified and screened more than 1,500 scientific papers, eventually analyzing the full text of over 800 empirical studies on the relationship between economic growth or GDP uh, and resource use, including materials and energy and greenhouse gas emissions. So they found that relative decoupling, so basically slowing down is, is the norm, but we know that this is not enough to meet, to meet the challenges of staying within a um, kind of stable and safe climate space. We need to have absolute decoupling. And what they concluded is that cases of absolute decoupling are rare. Uh, and where this happened, it had been to a decline in the share of fossil fuels in final energy use. So here, decarbonization is important. Um, but a bit over one third resulted from the reductions in energy use. So this is actually using less energy. So this is, again, the, the question of demand that I was mentioning. But then a really important part of this is that in the countries where, where these, this happened, so these 18 countries that they identified, um, it also coincided with low GDP growth rates between 1% and 2% per year. So it doesn't seem to be possible to decouple with high uh, economic growth rates. So if decoupling isn't really happening here, or it is happening, but it's happening at quite a slow pace from what we need it to be, and, and it has these limitations. Maybe we need to look at cutting the thread here and here, and what would that imply? What would that look like? So if we cut the thread here, we're really talking about redefining the goal of economic activity and thinking about economies in a, in a different way. And if we cut the thread here, maybe we need to redefine how we understand well-being, what energy is for. So I've only got a few slides left. So just to finish, I just want to kind of put some ideas out there for, for discussion. And, and I hope that these will, these will provoke an interesting discussion of, um, uh, it, it shortly. So redefining the goal of economic activity with, um, with being uh, International Women's Day yesterday, I wanted to highlight a couple of women uh, who have done a lot of work into this. So can we move um, beyond GDP as a measure of economic progress. Uh, so Kate Raworth here um, in her book, Don't Economics, she proposed this um, sort of um, framework where we can measure the, the impacts we're having on the environment. So the outer edge of the dome at outwards, uh, but also uh, see how well we're doing or not in terms of uh, social foundations. So having like a dashboard of indicators in terms of access to energy, water, food, health, education, income, you know, all of these things, housing, gender equality. And, and the goal for society should be to be within the donut, not overshooting ecological ceilings, but not having a shortfall of their social foundations. And then uh, Catherine Trebek here from the Wellbeing Economic Alliance has also done a lot of work on this. How would how would an economy look like if the goal wasn't economic growth, but actually well-being? And there are several governments who have kind of uh, jumped on, onto this, uh, including New Zealand, Scotland, Iceland, Wales, um, and they've they've actually taken um, actual policy steps to move in this direction. And recently, there's um, there uh, th th there's there's kind of a branch of of the Wellbeing Economic Alliance that launched in Canada. So that's that's quite a that's quite an interesting. Um, uh, development, I, I think. Um, and later in the questions, if you want, we can go. We can go through how this looks for Canada. This this sort of dashboard. Um, and redefining really well-being. What, what what do I mean by that? So conceptions of well well-being in, in Western societies really usually fall uh, within two broad categories. Um, Usually in economics, uh, well-being is related to maximizing utility, uh, which means preference satisfaction. And of course, how do we satisfy our preferences? Through consumption, right? 
Um, so therefore, the goal of, of any economy should be to increase our income so we can consume more, satisfy our preferences and maximize our utility. However, this has uh, serious economic implications that, that we've discussed already. So maybe a, an alternative way of, of looking at well-being would be uh, in terms of flourishing, right? Uh, what can we be or do in our life and, and in the broader context of society? Um, this opens the space for intergenerational citizenship, thinking about beyond the individual. Um, and then the main goal of social institutions is not to increase um, you know, levels, levels of, 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 of production and of income and, and increase possibilities of consumption, but rather enable people to flourish within, within their society. Um, but this is not the only, the only ways of, of understanding well-being. So this, these are a couple of examples. Uh, these are alternative idea, ideas of well-being. So Ubuntu is a Southern African concept whose main catchphrase is, I am because we are. So Ubuntu does not consider people as atomized individuals, but rather as embedded in social and biophysical relations. Uh, when we read, on the other hand, is a perspective originated from various indigenous traditions in Latin America. And then when we read, rejects traditional development discourses, which are derived from colonial and extractive traditions. Uh, instead, when we read, acknowledges uh, extended communities made up of humans and non-humans and puts substantial importance on uh, affectivity and spirituality. So it's, it's, it's not hard to see which conception of well-being has been uh, perhaps uh, driving these, these kind of levels of, of dependency on energy and um, you know, with its climate implications. Uh, so in changing the ideas around what constitutes a good life, uh, that in that could lie the key to surpassing the environmental challenges we face. So to finish in a, in a more positive note, like I promised, there was, um, there was a modeling effort, which I found really interesting, which was, okay, how much energy would we actually need for everyone in the world to have a, to have a good standard of living? And I think this is summarized really nicely in terms of um, one of their concluding paragraphs. So usually um, some people would, would critique these, these sorts of things by saying, oh, environmentalists are proposing that we return to living in caves. And uh, the authors of here say, re reply to that saying, yes, perhaps, but these caves have highly efficient facilities for cooking, storing food and washing clothes, low energy lighting throughout, 50 liters of clean water supplied per day per person with 15 liters heated to a comfortable bathing temperature. The, they man, maintain an air temperature of around 20 degrees throughout the year, irrespective of geography. Have a computer with access to global ICT networks, are linked to extensive transport networks, providing between 5,000 and 15,000 kilometers of mobility per person each year via various modes. And are also served by substantially larger caves, caves where universal healthcare is available and others that provide education for everyone between five and 19. So perhaps these, these, these caves are not as, um, you know, perhaps a, a future of where, where we re, rethink what is it that it, what is it, what does it mean to be well? What does a good life imply? And the, and the future where we redefine the goal of, of, of economies perhaps is not, is not as bad. Like certainly this, this cave here described by these research doesn't sound, researchers doesn't sound too bad to me. So yeah, to finish up, um, in, in, in my opinion, sometimes it's, uh, in, in my opinion, actually, the, the, it, it, it's not, it's the economy stupid, it's perhaps, it's, it's the stupid economy. Um, now, the, the, the difficult question here, which I haven't provided any answers for, is, you know, how, how do we, how do we change the way we understand the economy? How do we change the way, way we understand well-being? That's really hard to answer. But there are some things that I can say, uh, and this is perhaps goes somewhat in, in towards an, answering Andrew's questions at, at the beginning. Um, I, I, I think that the relentless pursuit of economic growth won't get us there. I think that sustaining or increasing the currently 
you know, really obscene levels of inequality of income, of energy, of CO2 emissions won't get us there. And I think things like the current view of waste being considered economically efficient, for example, things like planned obsolescence, that won't get us there. So, yeah, I, perhaps I can't say exactly how, but I can, I, I can say what won't get us there, and that, that might lead to, to, to answering that, that, that question that Andrew, that Andrew posed at the beginning. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions. So first of all, I really want to thank you, and I really want to thank you for highlighting some some different ways of looking at things and some interesting challenges that we face. Um, so I'm going to start off with a couple of questions. Um, you, hopefully they're provocative. You won't find them. <laughs> can't, what's the word? Contra well, they're going to be controversial. So, um, but that's my job as an academic, I think, somewhat. Um, so, so let me just start off. So it, it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, you talk about uh, maybe I'm, I'm going to kind of paraphrase it. Um, stop the drive for big, you know, the drive for bigger cars, but think about getting people to what is it they need to get where they want to get to. Um, and it seems to me that is a, a challenge with fundamental human motivations and behaviors. I, I was very when I was a teenager, I went to stay on a kibbutz in Israel for a while, and it was a very a very socialist kibbutz, and lots of people loved it you know they got the bait whatever you want to call them those necessities didn't have to live in caves but you know what it, it looked a lot like you're describing but the only reason it worked and it was really interested was because you could leave if you didn't like it mm -hmm. and therefore people left and said well I, i'm working really hard and that person's not working hard and i'm doing this and so that accumulation of you know let's call it wealth or things or energy consuming things was a core driver, a motivator for some people. Um, I'm not saying it's for everyone. Um, if you kind of view this as well, we could change people's behavior to what they need, isn't that going to be like a cultural change? And is that not going to also, uh, you know, the, the, the problem that we've seen, and, you know, I don't want to point particular to countries at the moment, given conflicts that are going on, but the problems that we see is that if you lose that individual motivation, then that actually stifles the well-being of everybody. Um, yeah, no, that's um, that's a good point, and it's a, it, it, it's a difficult question. So, uh, one one thing that I found really interesting, and I actually read this from Kate Rower's book, is that you know, it's this question of are we intrinsically selfish, and are we intrinsically individually motivated? Or is this something that is sort of um, pushed through society and societal norms and stuff? So one, one study actually points out that um, as you teach economic students about what Adam Smith would say about selfishness and, and all these things, and as you teach them about marginal, marginal utility, as you teach them about all these things, um, you interview them before and after, uh, students actually become more selfish, and more self-interested. So, so uh, kind of my, my reply to that would be, well, uh, you know, if we can create, if we can lead to, by, by kind of the way we design societies and institutions and ways of thinking, if we can lead to people behaving in a, in a particular way, we can surely do that That's the other way around. So, right? Yeah, I, I agree, actually. So that's actually a very interesting answer to that question I posed about what would you do if you're prime minister, which is uh, attribute more value in society to things that are better for society. So, you know, I, I remember having arguments with my economics professor at uh, Waterloo um, who said, you know, Wikipedia can't exist because everyone's contributing their knowledge for free and they're not getting anything in return for it. And so that doesn't work. And he also argued the idea that trust between people was a facilitator of transactions. And he said, no, you need punishments if they misbehave. And so I, I think there is a, a social system that can reinforce some of those positive things and the impact people are having on society. Um, so I'm kind of going back to my original question. So if you were prime minister, let's assume we can solve it for Canada or address it for Canada, we're not going to solve it, forgetting the world. 
how, how would you do that? I mean, it's fine to say it would be nice if people were more uh, intrinsically motivated and were more caring about their society. A lot of people in Canada are. We see it so many times, uh, people stepping up and helping each other. But how do we how do we move the majority of people to behave like that? Well, I think I think this is sort of like um, this was an analogy that I had from from one of my professors when I was doing my BA. Right, when there's really difficult problems, you've got like a colander with really big holes, and the water's coming out of it. And if you block one hole, it'll just come faster out the others. So you need to try and kind of close all the holes at the same time, right? So I would do things like, for example change the you know what, what one of one of one of the one of the points that i mentioned was around inequalities so i'd really focus on tackling that tackling inequalities through all sorts of tools um, around taxation and, and all sorts of tools that, that would allow redistribution but also things like um you know what is the motivation of of, of individual companies uh and this 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 whole thing about shareholder value is really complicated right um, I think there needs to be the prioritization of other values. Um, and, and other stakeholders. Here, yeah, and other, other stakeholders and perhaps including future generations there. How are, how are decisions made in, 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 in the policy arena? You know, if it's all down to a cost-benefit analysis that perhaps doesn't value future benefits and future costs as highly, depending on the discount rate you use, then there needs to be other ways. So, for example, in, in Wales, with this Wellbeing Economic Alliance, one of the things that Wales has done has, is, is do, um, you know, every project that Wales approves has to, has to have a measurable, you know, measure and assess the impact on future generations. So, therefore, they're, they're already shifting, shifting the value of what, what is important for, for, for that government and shifting the way they make decisions and, and take priorities. So I think, you know, it's all those sorts of things at the same time. So I think I think it's a really good point. I mean, I think your your comment about the, the colander or the sieve or whatever and closing up the holes, um, I think it's a really good one and it really is a attitudinal cultural change. And I think, um, I don't know where the leadership, you know, comes from to do that. I mean, uh, I don't, again, I, I, I don't want to get into too many politically contentious issues that we will do if we're talking about political advice, but you know, setting an agenda as a country where we are encouraging people to do this um, does seem to be, um, you know, a, a way forward. Um, and I, I think um, there, there are lots of ways uh, that we could maybe consider doing that. Um, I'm going to ask you another question, which as an engineer, I'm always going to, to ask, which is, you know, uh, there were a couple of slides that you presented that struck me that, that you know technology is the solution. And I absolutely understand that if you make energy more freely available, that people might use more of it. I, I absolutely understand that. But that's that's an impact, an unintended impact. It's not what you plan to do. Um, mm -hmm. But there are many areas where, first of all, you can decouple carbon from energy. For example, if we were all nuclear power, we wouldn't be creating carbon emissions, right? Um, and and so uh, and obviously if we were solar power the same argument so so um we have seen massive changes in the cost of solar um and and i don't think we've even scratched the surface yet i think we're going to see see more of that so um the first one is um how important do you think focusing our technology development on some of these challenges um versus some of the other things we're spending money on how, how might that change it? So, you know, I, I, I look at the example of uh, the reduction in energy use that we've had from LED bulbs compared to traditional bulbs, right? Um, and I look at all these servers, you know, that are, are you know, powering Facebook or social media or uh, Bitcoin or, or whatever. And you say, well, you know, the fundamental problem is that the chips inside are hot. They don't need to be hot. You could make chips that ran cold. We just don't have a technology yet. Um, so, can't we solve some of these big challenges just by getting on with the technology innovation that we need to address those issues? And how do we prioritize that? Yeah, so I think, you know, I, I, I'm not against uh, technological development at all. I think by all means, um, you know, work on developing efficiency improvements and, and, and using less energy. Uh, the point that I was trying to make is, you know, we need to consider that that 
very likely will lead to a rebound. And how are you going to lead to that rebound? That will very likely lead to increases in energy demand elsewhere. And that needs to be included in modeling, which it isn't at the moment uh, at all, really. So, so that's kind of, that's one point. And then the other point is to say, given the scale of the challenge, unless we find ways of, of reducing absolute levels of, of energy demand, um, this is going to be a very, very uphill struggle, right? Um, it's going to be so much easier. Only if find... it's carbon-based. Sorry? Only if it's carbon-based. Only if you, I mean, we only need to reduce energy demand if the negative impact of energy demand is carbon emissions. But if we do it yeah. with solar or we do it with nuclear, which don't, or hydro, which is less, less flexible, um, which don't have carbon, then you don't need to reduce energy demand. Yeah, but the problem is that uh, currently uh, the, the switch towards non-carbon sources of energy is only um, replacing oh, in, in new levels, right? Oh, 100%. So that, 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 that is saying, the problem. So yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm the, just saying you can accelerate it. Well, yeah, perhaps, but uh, reducing levels of energy demand, and this is where reducing inequalities comes in, uh, and perhaps refocusing our, our economic efforts, uh, makes the challenge that much easier. If demand is not increasing every every time, every time, then the yes, speed 100%. at which renewables are, are like coming will, 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 will actually make a dent in, in all of this, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's just that, you know, um, I, I was surprised, although I keep hearing it because of my friends that are involved in cryptocurrencies, um, about the amount of energy that's consumed in, yeah. in, in server farms. I was shocked about what percentage of our energy consumption is now going there. And yes. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm just pointing out that the energy that is really used there, which is creating heat, is actually not useful. Every, every watt of heat that's produced from those server farms is not doing the job of actually what it's meant to do. It's actually wasted. So yeah. if we could if we could solve that technological challenge, then just like we've done with LED lights, we could do the same in service. Yeah, no, and it is it is it is absolutely huge. So for example, I don't know if you if some of you will remember this video Gundam style, the number of times that it has been um, you know streamed um, has used the equivalent of energy that is used in Bangladesh for a year. You know. It's it's absolutely mind blowing. Um, so this this is this is kind of that was my point in terms of moving to a service economy. You know, perhaps we can solve the technological challenge, but at the at the moment, moving to a service economy or cloud or all of that has a very real physical reality that is often ignored, and that reality is linked to energy. And unfortunately, our energy system is still fossil fuel dependent. Absolutely. Um, Sorry, Ali, did you want to ask something? No? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and uh, thank you, Lena. Very, very insightful. Thank you for, for sharing your, uh, your work with us. Um, there are some questions on the chat. Uh, maybe uh, go to them first and uh, come back to uh, my own question if there is time. Yeah, there was a great, there was a great, well, but I'm not sure I answered the question. Was Is the relationship between Gini coefficient mm -hmm. of a society and well-being and can we measure the Gini coefficient of energy usage? Yeah, so yes, we can We can measure the energy uh, coefficient of, of, uh, of Gini. In fact, there's, there's several studies that have done this. And what they find is that it's, it's very similar. The, the, the levels of inequality of income, energy, and CO2 emissions are, are very high. Um, so I can, I can post some links to, to studies that have actually mentioned, uh, measured that. Um, so when you say, I think it will be almost equivalent to the Gini coefficient of income, you're absolutely right. Um, and then is there a relationship between Gini coefficient of a society and well-being? Um, I think there is. Um, I don't know quantitatively how, I think there has been studies that have, have done this quantitatively, but what springs to mind at the moment is a, is a, is a book called the, the Spirit Level, not in terms of spirituality, but the Spirit Level in terms of the things that measures them. You know how level something is, um, and what they what they do is kind of look at the social um, and kind of well-being consequences of inequality, uh, and they're they're really impactful in all sorts of ways. So, 
uh, you know, in terms of health inequalities, it's huge. Uh, things like even, even your own personal well-being, in terms of how do you feel around your community? If there's high levels of inequality, it tends to aggravate uh, feelings of uh, being unsafe, you know, all these sorts of things. It's like there's all sorts of ripple effects that inequality has on well-being. So I think there is a relationship, yeah, definitely. I was just interested in one of your char charts about energy consumption. I mean, I wasn't surprised that Canada didn't fare that well, although I was perhaps surprised about the inequality in that uh, that uh, graph. Um, but but isn't there an inherent issue in Canada with, with climate? I mean, I'm just thinking in the cold weather, um, people just have to heat things more. And, you know, I mean, again, I'm not, an, I have been to Bangladesh, but I'm not an expert in Bangladesh, but I don't think they get minus 30 degree temperatures. Um, um, so yeah. it, are, no. there, are there inherent geographical differences yeah. that um, underline that differences in energy? Yeah, no, absolutely. And Bangladesh doesn't get minus 30, but it gets plus 30 quite a lot. And then they don't have enough cooling to be at a comfortable room temperature. So they, they have issues where they're not achieving comfortable levels of, of, of thermal comfort within their homes. But in the case of Canada, you're absolutely right. There's, 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 um, you know, there's, there's, there's kind of the issue of the weather is really important. And of course, we have to keep warm when it's freezing, at, freezing cold outside. But uh, when it comes to the efficiency improvements that we were talking about, you know, is it, you know, what, what is the solution? Is it, is it to electrify heating all across the country? Yeah, well, perhaps that's an element. Maybe we can install heat pumps everywhere or something like that. But what about um, passive systems? Passive systems would be, in this case, a house. Can we make our houses less leaky so they don't have to get as much energy to start with. If the house is properly insulated and not leaky, it will require a smaller amount of energy to keep it at a comfortable temperature. And then this goes hand in hand with the energy demand reductions that I was talking about, right? Maybe we need to invest in the infrastructure as well, these passive systems. So so, so let me let me ask a big question now. I do want to let Ali ask his question. Um, one of the things that Frank Stronach was trying to do with his scholarship and with the work he's kind of doing and helping us get going at York is to say, I don't really think politicians are the place to solve some of these issues and these challenges mm -hmm. um, because they always have to think about voters. They're always beholden to people that vote them, sponsorship. I think that a lot of the leadership on new ways of thinking needs to come out of universities. And then the politicians mm -hmm. can say, I'm going to go with that school of thought or that approach that they're, you know, getting from, you know, academics. We can afford to be a little bit more off the wall, outspoken, or uh, without it coming back and biting us in the backside. So, with that in mind, how do you think we can facilitate more of these conversations in an academic environment, and either York or elsewhere, to try to come up with things that actually. Uh, when politicians, maybe that it's Green Party politicians, but hopefully it's across the board, could say this sounds like something that could be defining for Canada and, and how we try and approach this. Because uh, being very blunt, you're more likely to succeed with many of these things in Canada than you are in, say, the US. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a really good question and it's a, and it's a big challenge. Um, I think you're right. Politicians are, are moved kind of by all sorts of other other things and you know there's, there's issues about how the democracies are structured but that's a completely different conversation um but i think in terms of how can we promote these conversations and coming up coming out of universities i think i think initiatives like like the well-being economic alliance that i mentioned have been quite have been quite successful at, at doing that kind of um, it's kind of it's kind of a middle ground institution where it takes insights from the academic community, translate them, translates them to something kind of more uh, digestible or palatable for, for policymakers, and then they've managed to get some governments on board, actually making making changes in a, in, a, in this direction. And what they're doing, I think, very cleverly, is using the, the concept of well-being, which is which is very difficult for a politician to say that they're against, you know. <laughs> Who's against, which party is against increasing the well-being of everyone in Canada, right? Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's, that's, that's perhaps quite a clever way of, of, of moving the conversation. 
I don't know. Yeah, no, I, first of all, I agree with you. And I, I just think that uh, kind of the challenge that Frank gave to us, and I could see, uh, you know, what happens is he gives it at a very high level, because very high level people at the university want to meet with, with him. Um, but it's actually the more practitioners in the field like yourself who probably have a closer to coming up with ways to move forward. So um, I think that's the challenge that uh, we all have is to do that um, hopefully at York, hopefully with collaborators across Canada and across the world, because if they're using a great program like the one you just mentioned in Wales, then why would we not, you know, replicate the best bits and see how we could apply it? Ali, I know you have some questions. Sure, thank you. Um, there is one question in the chat and there, there is one that I have. I'm going to read first the one that is in the chat and I'm going to follow up after that with, with my question. And that is from uh, Jarubin, uh is asking, um, it's a very general question about, um, uh, I had a quest, quick question, uh, out of wind, uh, hydro, solar and nuclear, which sector do you uh, see growing faster in the next 10 or 15 years? That's a general question, but if you have any insight on that, that would be good. And I go up to my question after. Um, yeah, well, thanks, uh, Tarawin, for the question. Um, I have to say, I'm not like a, I'm not an expert on, on kind of energy markets. Um, I think but you know, what, what comes to mind is I, I think this will, be, this will be very dependent on, on each country and the, the resources that they have available. And it'll depend very much on, uh, for example, countries, um, industrial strategies, right? If they want to promote these sorts of sectors within, within their own country. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't give you kind of a more interesting answer, but this is, yeah, I'm not, not, not really an expert there. Right, thank you. Um, my uh, my question uh, is not actually a question. It's more of uh, having your your uh, your comments and uh, discussions around this. Uh, you know, I, I really like the idea of um, this narrative about um, this economy stupid and stupid economy. I mean, this is this is certainly saying a lot uh, to the current situation and how we can change this. But uh, I was wondering if, if you uh, or any other people are, are trying to change the narrative into the fact that this economy is, is made of uh, actions and activities of all of us individually, as a person, as a family, and as a company, uh, as a teacher, as a, you know, as a worker, as a uh, I mean, we are, the economy is made of all these, you know, uh, activities, people. And this is really about us making bad decisions and uh, or doing uh, uh, bad behavior, short term, long term. And unless we, we turn the, the focus from, you know, something that may take the blame instead of us, probably, uh, the, it may not be resolved. We, we should bear some of these, you know, blame individually to get this uh, sorted somehow. I know there are some, but I, I really want your, your own uh, observation and uh, what, what you think about uh, these kind of changing the, the sh or shifting the, the focus uh, to ourselves, making that change because it's gonna, at the end of the day, this uh, is impacting all of us individually, family-based, you know, community-based, etc. So I stop, but uh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. Um, uh, I think I think it's I think it's really difficult. I think there's a spectrum of how people understand this, right? Some people would say that um, you know all or most of the responsibility lies on the individual, and then some people would say no, this is all about the system, and we need to change the system. Um, and I think I think that the, the, the reality is perhaps somewhere in the middle, because I, I take your point, what you're saying at the end of the day, the individuals making decisions, but there are systems that influence why we make decisions, right? So the other day I wanted to go to Mississauga and um, it was going to take me two hours on public transport or it was going to take me half an hour if I drove. Now, I don't have a car here, but I'm, do, I'm part of a car sharing scheme, but the option was really easy for me. I was going to take half an hour in the, share, in the car, right? So it's, I don't think I should um, have all the blame in that case, 
I think the systems that are around kind of lead me to that. If there was a better trans public transport system to Mississauga in this case, perhaps I would have just taken that option, right? So it's not all about our decisions, and it's the same. It's the same in terms of uh, companies' corporate responsibility that we were talking about, right? If if their goal is to maximize shareholder value, then they are quite limited as well in terms of what they can do. So can can we can we change that so that it, it leads uh, behaviors in in, in 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 different directions? So I think it's a it's probably a, a mixture of both, right? It's um, we need to we need to have the individual changes and, and the individual uh, yeah willingness to change to, to to want to push for 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 things to go in different directions but we also then have to have the the the, the systemic changes to to allow to allow for these kind of these types of behaviors to, to happen more easily um yeah that's can I, can I just add a comment to that very quickly? Because uh, I know that we have uh, uh, Professor Cohen, I think he's giving the session in a couple of weeks' time, and uh, he runs a program around environmental management, but he spent 20 years with the EPA in, in the US. And the question I asked him is, you know, what's the role of government regulations on, on some of these things? And he was very emphatic and he said, you know, we used to think, uh, you know, 20 years ago there, we were, we, we were each as individuals responsible for environmental, uh, for recycling, for doing all of those things. Um, but then if the system is against you doing that, it doesn't make it easy to make the right choices, mm -hmm. then you'll never be successful. So he, he would kind of say that um, it's important that um, different organizations, including governments, uh, address these issues at different levels um, and that therefore they can... Uh, influence by by you know educating about what the right thing to do and, and maybe incenting and then going back to my original point maybe uh, uh encouraging technology development in those fields so, you know for, for example at the moment and this is you know in my own field uh it, it has slightly changed the last couple of months so but typically if you did some good research and you uh, asked for funding for it from NSERC, if it was like leading edge research then they would fund it uh, if you were a good researcher, but maybe it didn't have an impact on sustainability goals. And that if you started to change your requirements for funding of research, that you have to show some, you know, benefit in terms of sustainability goals. Uh, I'm saying particularly around climate, but it can be about other things too. Then all of a sudden, that will change how people spend their time and their money, and the outcomes will be more, more linked. So. Um, it's it's carrots and sticks i think it's and and it's it's uh i think that's the big question and i i kind of go back to the challenge that we have set for this for the competition that's related to this speaker series which is what what is the role of government in terms of uh, doing things and what is the role of government in terms of persuading individuals to do the right thing and i think it becomes a very interesting balance yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a, that's a really good point. And um, economists such as uh, Mariana Matsukatu have said, you know, the, the role of the entrepreneurial state, basically in terms of this and uh, promoting, you know, the pathways for, for an economy to go in, in, in one direction or another. And it'd be very easy for, for, for governments to prioritize certain I, areas. I, what was the reference you just gave? I, I... Ma Mariana Matsukatu. Oh, okay. I've put, I've put it there in the... Okay. In the chat. So that's um, yeah. So, so and then, for example, in the case of the of the recovery from COVID, it would have been very, very easy for governments to require companies to to have at least a little move in terms, of, you know, towards sustainability in order to be able to access the grants. But this didn't happen. Yeah. I think that was a missed opportunity, right? I think there's um, also. I think you're absolutely right. I think. They could, you know, I'm actually trying to do that. So I, I live in Mississauga. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, uh, one of my uh, colleagues from University of Toronto is now involved in economic development in the city. And I said, I don't think people have recognized how land use is going to change because of COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. With terms of, you know, offices are going to be half empty and different experiences and different, you know. Um, all of a sudden, people that uh, put up a building or a warehouse or whatever for one function, the function's quite different. 
maybe there's ways that we could look at all the resources in the community and find better ways to share and collaborate than just well you have that building and you have that building you know maybe the sharing economy could work for you know well i have these extra offices i'm not using you could use those or uh, extra car you know for for, for ride share that's not financially driven ride share like uber but just the right thing to do ride share um and so i think i think there is uh there's definitely um it would be great to introduce some of the challenges you suggested today to some of the policies that people are doing as they move forward yeah so no, I think we've actually come. Uh, so, do you have something else? Because I, I think I was going to say that we've kind of come to a natural end of the presentation. Uh, but did you want to add some, ask something else? Not, not from me. Uh, okay, but you but, probably know the answer to this question about who's talking next week. Uh, is it Eric? Is that Eric Miller, right? Uh, for for next next week. Yeah, Eric. Yes, it's uh, Eric Miller. Um, Talking about GDP, uh, is gross. Yeah, his well-being is. He wants to know if GDP is gross. I thought that was quite a yeah. good pun. Economists will get the cop the pun, but if you didn't get the pun, you'll find out next week. Well-being is better. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so Le Lena, thank you so much for joining us. I am sure that we're going to kind of connect again as we kind of move forward on the agenda of how can York take a leadership role in trying to address some of these challenges and set some directions and guides. Um, I do, I had not thought about it until Frank actually said it, which was probably not politicians as the, you know, is going to address these issues. I was uh, very involved when I was in the UK until 1984 in politics and coming up with policies and strategies for the, for the uh, party. But at the end of the day, you know, my, everyone told me you can't be in politics because you'll say the wrong thing at the wrong time and you'll, you'll lose votes. And, you know, so I do think that as academics, we have a, a level of, intellectual horsepower and freedom of thought uh, and we have our students who are not maybe um, as constrained by what the right thing to do or what the traditional thing to do is but maybe can think out of the box um, i'm excited because we're actually translating that into action this weekend we have our startup weekend this weekend uh, which i think we have two something students participating and coming up with startup ideas the cool thing that we've morphed our uh, incentive to it was used to be when we did it, it was like to start up anything but now we're really looking for businesses as a, addressing UN sustainability goals as part of their business uh, mission so uh, we'll see what comes out of that how it empowers people to actually take actions themselves so I'm excited about that Great. so yeah. uh, Lena thank you so much for joining us today thank you for sharing your insights uh, we will share the video uh, on, on the website um, and I, I'm sure that we'll get lots of traction and you may get some more questions uh, from people. Um, thank you for joining the discussion. Thank and you so much for inviting me, Andrew. Absolutely. Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Andrew. Awesome. Thank you. And we'll see everyone uh, next Wednesday, 12.30.